Hello, everyone. I'm here to talk about how deaf people are the world's gain. And I'd like to first clarify what I mean when I use the word deaf as an identifier, right? We um, live in a majority hearing world and identify as deaf people. We are a community that has people with many identities. So a person might be deaf, but they have other intersections of a variety of identities. And for today's talk, I'm going to talk about the uh, larger identity of being deaf and how that benefits our world. Now, we as deaf people, we have been on this earth over 10,000 years. There are over 400 types of deaf genes. This is not new. And there, I believe, is a reason we're here. So if you see the picture that I'm showing, take a look and see if you can identify who is deaf and who can hear. I will talk about that later uh, toward the end of my talk. So I'd like to start talking about how we benefit the world. If we think about film and media, today we are addicted to film and media, social media, et cetera. And back in 1924, actually, a Jewish deaf gentleman who lived in Germany actually invented what we know today as the television. His name was Zietlin. That was his last name. And he was the young age of 17. If you can imagine that, a 17-year-old invented what we know today as television. And I think there's a nice twist. One of our major brands is Zenith, right? Um, which was invented by Zietlin. So when we think about films also, what we know today as movies started at, as a very different medium. It was silent films. And deaf people back in that time realized very quickly the value that that medium provided for disseminating information. A gentleman we know in our deaf community by the name of George Veditz is the father of using film to get information out to the community. From there, those of you who could hear people in, in that time started to develop ways to add sound and now film is everywhere. We also now have video logs that started as blogs, right? When the internet first started, a, a lot of people used that as a medium to get information out and deaf people very quickly wanted to use video as ways to get information out. So deaf people first launched the idea of video logs and we now see it everywhere. We have deaf people to thank for that as well. So taking a look at that photo of a football huddle, we see football many times in our lives, right? We when we watch the Kansas City Chiefs, the football huddle is something that's a very basic part of football. Well, it was invented in Washington, D.C. at Gallaudet University, which is the world's only liberal arts deaf uh, university for deaf, hard of hearing, children who have deaf adults and uh, hearing children as well. So people who can hear who have deaf adults, deaf parents, et cetera, are able to attend this university. And so at this university, when they were playing football, when there was the realization that the other team could see what they were talking about and in, in discussing their plays, they came up with the concept of a huddle. So that took fire. Thank you to Paul Hubbard, the first football player who invented the idea of huddling together. So this demonstrates ways that deaf people navigate the world. We in large part have a visual orientation. So a number of ways that spaces are designed in our 
uh, phonocentric or audiocentric environment, we have adjusted based on our own world experience. For example, uh, one way that, that we are able to navigate uh, the world when we are driving, we are able to communicate with other drivers on the road through our windows, uh, being that as long as we both understand sign language. So when I see another deaf driver, we can communicate with, with each other. So having those clear windows as ways to communicate is key for us. Uh, when we are in hallways or in other um, areas of buildings, oftentimes those spaces are narrow, which make it difficult for us to communicate and are not only barriers for us as deaf people, but mothers or parents having uh, deaf babies or babies in strollers or people who are in larger groups trying to discuss or people who might be in wheelchairs or moving furniture with carts or dollies. There are a number of examples where that could create a barrier. So we often will then have larger hallways in deaf spaces. We can look at the concept of universal design uh, and looking at elevators, for example, that the concept of how elevators apply to universal design and benefit everyone, even though they weren't originally um, invented for that purpose. And we can look at the ways that closed captioning or captioning services benefit all of us if we take a universal design approach. Because not only deaf people will benefit, but other people who are losing their hearing or who, who are in noisy environments such as bars or um, other places where there is a, a competing noise. So text-based communication can be for everyone, not just for uh, deaf people. Um, other kinds of things that we see as accommodation or like the elevator are not only for people who are unable to go upstairs, but for everyone. Another area that I um, think deaf space benefits to the world is the way that we have our interior uh, buildings. So oftentimes, if you might remember your elementary school had glossy paint and fluorescent lighting that hurt your eyes and caused tremendous eye fatigue. Oftentimes in deaf spaces, we use a flat paint or um, matte finish. And those fluorescent lights, we do not use. We use other more gentle forms of, life, of lighting so we can focus on learning. We see that more and more schools are also making those adjustments. So that's another example of universal design. We can look at public announcements, right, that are typically um, given over a, some sort of a, a, a system where everybody hears those public announcements. But when people are in noisy environments, they may not be able to hear those announcements on those PA systems. So using text-based communications to provide public announcements would benefit everyone, not only the deaf community. People who can hear would also appreciate that information. It will allow for clarity of the information and repetition of the information. So that's another way that the deaf way of being can contribute to our world. There are other examples of how I think we are ahead of the game. Uh, more and more as people are introspective about their identities, uh, we specifically look at the gender continuum and uh, folks who are beginning to identify as non-binary as opposed to only um, being male or female. Our language, particularly English language, is very limiting in pronoun use. Right? And we're having to look at ways to use our language and different pronoun usage. American Sign Language is already ahead of that game. We do not have gender-based pronouns. We use indexing as a way to uh, demonstrate pronouns, and that would include the entire continuum of gender identity. So there is no adjustment we have to make when it comes to uh, referring to people and uh, how they identify. So there's another gain for uh, our world.
so the the recent slide that I showed, you might have noticed there was a deaf baby and a hearing baby, and it's titled The Greatest Irony because it demonstrates the fact that while sign language was invented by deaf people, used by deaf people, and by the way, there are 300 plus signed languages in the world that have been in the world and used by deaf people and by people who can hear, who use the language to relate with and interact with deaf people. Absolutely hearing people use this sign language. However, the irony is that since the Industrial Revolution, probably around the 1800s, there has been more and more of a shift as seeing sign language as a deficit or a problem that exists, as uh, a temporary fix or band-aid. For example, in that uh, illustration that I just showed you, it showed a hearing baby with the sign of I, what we know as I love you, right, with a smile on its face. Because science has shown, right, in infants, their vocal cords and uh, they, don't they don't yet have the ability to produce sounds. And this can cause temper tantrums often and a great deal of frustration because they're unable to express themselves. So, Baby sign has been an, an approach to that in teaching infants sign. However, and those babies don't experience the terrible twos, right? Because they are having sign. Deaf babies who are exposed to sign language also have that experience of being able to express themselves. Sign has also been given as a supplement or a resource to children who are um, have disabilities of sorts and unable to express themselves. And the irony is that deaf babies who are born often to hearing parents, and hearing parents are surprised by this, they're not informed about what, what to do, are often advised by the medical professionals that they should not sign, that they should not teach their infant sign language, that they should teach them to speak. And that comes from the idea of seeing sign language and being deaf as a deficit. So that's an irony that hearing babies are offered this as a resource while deaf babies are deprived of their birthright. We can also look at colleges and universities that uh, teach American Sign Language. And colleges and universities that teach languages as such as French, Spanish, or other modern languages tend to have departments such as foreign language department or language studies or something that houses their languages. Well, American Sign Language is not housed in those departments. It's typically housed in special education, speech and language hearing sciences, or communication disorders, as opposed to being housed in foreign language departments. Again, that demonstrates a deficit view of sign language, which is the opposite of how we see our rich language. We also can take a look at ways that deaf children are educated in our society. There are mainstream environments that have deaf programs uh, as well as deaf residential schools. And many of those do not have language ASL instruction or curriculum as part of their educational environment. While their hearing peers have the luxury of getting language classes in their own native language as well as taking a foreign language such as American Sign Language. Deaf children themselves, that this is their native language, do not have that luxury of having a curriculum for their own language to strengthen their own language. So there's yet another irony. So that recent slide, I really say is the antithesis to my thesis, right? It shows this deficit model that of how we are looked at as a deaf people, right? This deaf elephant being in the room that uh, tries to force us to be hearing, tries to force us to change who we are. 
there is about 75% of children, this is a rough estimate, that have experienced language deprivation or severe language delay. So they are not kindergarten ready when they arrive to that age. Their cognitive abilities, their social emotional abilities, and their self-identity is truly lacking and suffering. This creates a larger gap every year for deaf children as they progress in their school and education because they are denied the right to sign. Typically, it's when parents notice these uh, gaps and these delays by the time the child is seven or eight that they start to expose them to sign language and it is too late by that time. There's a small percentage of children who are still able to succeed, but many of them don't because they have missed that language window. So this brings me back to my first photograph, right? With the two, with the people showing, it's the female with her hand showing her ring, who's deaf, and the male with curly hair and glasses who is hearing. And this just is a perfect example of showing how human biodiversity can exist. Deaf people are a cultural linguistic minority. We are people too. Thank you all for your attention this evening.